Okay. Я сказал великан. Так что не, не обзывал? Okay. <coughs> so um, we want to talk about the history of Jews in England and um, you know focusing on some of the major tragedies that occurred there for the Jewish people. So the the the, the Jewish sojourn in England had two stages to it. There was, so we're going to talk about only the, the first stage. The first stage, so we don't really know <clears throat> if, you, if you can follow the timeline if you have. So basically, we have the map of England on the timeline. And uh, the places that we're going to mention are, are circled. And so before the, the Norman, what's called the Norman Conquest, before the Norman Co Conquest, there are very little information about Jews living in England at all. Um, in Jewish literature, as we'll see in the Kinois, England is refers, referred to as Iye Hayam. Iye Hayam, which means the I islands of the sea, or isles of the sea. So the land of the isles. So that's what, what England is called in, uh, in Jewish literature. And so, um, so before, before the Norman Conquest, this happened in the year 1066, when uh, William the Conqueror came from Normandy, which is the northern province of France, and uh, you know there was a dispute of who's going to be the next heir, as usual it is, as it goes, and he conquered. He was able to conquer, to be victorious, and within after his reign, he basically he wanted um, to 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 fill up the the country with his allies. Or the phrase that I heard used, uh, or I saw used, is he wanted to be paid in coin, not in kind. In other words, he was afraid of retribution, and so he wanted to, and he basically pushed out, or squeezed out, or, or punished, or killed most of the um, aristocracy of England that existed there before his time. And so he said, and he settled the place, and he promoted his own people. So in 1066, a part of this plan was bringing in Jews from northern France because they would be his they would they would be his allies. So the capital of Normandy in in France is Rouen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Right. Rouen. Rouen. Okay. So so Jews from Rouen um, began to move over to England around this time this time of 10, 1066. So as you see, there there are there are, Jews are mentioned in some of the earlier Christian canons, like the canons of Egbert, in around 750. But again, I think the scholars say that um, that mention is just based on other various you know previous earlier synods, like the Synod of Elvira, which is one of the earliest Christian synods, where a Jew was you know is not allowed to eat with uh, Christians, is not allowed to eat with Jews. Other things like that. So the, there's no raya, so to speak, that Jews exist. That Jews lived in England before the Norman conquest. But in the beginning, so as usual goes for, for for Jews everywhere they settle. The beginning life for Jews seems to be going pretty well, you know, until it doesn't. And so we have a similar situation here, where we have we have Jews beginning to settle in um, in England. Um, in England, partially again because they were given the opportunity to live there, and partially because this was a right around um, the First Crusade, right? Which the Jews of again Germany and France suffered terribly during the First Crusade. So this was a chance to escape, also. So we have the first what they call Norman kings, right? They're, they're, that's uh, William the Conqueror, William Rufus. Or, or Stan, they call him Rufus, or and Henry the First. Okay, so all, and all during these king, these kings, more or less, Jews were okay. There was a cemetery. I mean, they were again. They were they were obviously paying high taxes. Yes, they were they were allowed to do one of the reasons. You know, through all of the medieval countries, the reason why Jews were allowed to live there is because they were they needed there for loans. Right, as we'll talk a little later, Jews were money lenders because they were allowed to lend to Goyim with interest. Goyim Christians were not allowed to lend with, with interest, and no project really can be done without loans. So they needed the Jews for the loans, for the for the money lending business. 
So, but because it was considered such a lowly, disgusting thing that people lend money with interest, usury was considered to be the lowliest of the low, and so they taxed it in at exorbitant rates as well, besides all the other head taxes and Jew taxes that Jews had to pay on top of everybody else. Right? So, so Jews were, A, they were property of the king, in general, th throughout, th throughout the, this time, in all the countries, Jews were property of the king, as opposed to, again, we're talking about era, just to bring everybody into it, we're talking about the era of feudalism, right? Meaning country, because there's no such thing as centralized government, there's no such thing as like, we're talking about, you know, there is the, 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 the count, the earl, the duke, whatever it is, the lord of the manor, and he kind of runs the show on his lands. You know, and so any kind of kingly authority actually means that he's, it's undermining his local authority. So that was always a point of contention where the, the barons in England, they were called the barons, and uh, the, or the other aristocracy used to fight for power with the king. And this is where the Jews, as we'll see, Jews always got in the middle of this of this tug of war, because officially Jews were property of the king, meaning they did not belong, even though they resided on different in different locales, but they mainly belonged, so to speak, they, they, they got royal protection from the king, and the king had the right to tax them exclusively, and so, and so, you know, so the, 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 the benefit directly went to the king and not to the barons. And so the barons weren't weren't too happy with mm -hmm. having Jews on their on their property. Furthermore, as we'll see again, barons were also borrowing heavily from the Jews. So whenever if they would have an opportunity to um, to get rid of those debts one way or another, they would definitely use it. Okay. So at this time, we have um, we have we have evidence of Jews um, settling in Oxford. Again, if you look at the map. There, Oxford is, is 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 not far from London, right? Um, so uh, L London also. So around there, they they do have one cemetery, only one cemetery for all of England, called the Jews Garden. Okay, Still the Jews Garden. No, it's it's uh, it's it's next to the, the I think it's called Jubilee Street or whatever it's called. Whatever the street, the main street. So, um, um, some of the churches in, uh, in England also have these funny names. For example, I'm just giving you one example. It's called the St. Lawrence Jury's Church. The St. Lawrence Jury's Church. Why? Why would it be called that? And the answer is because there were many different churches. This one was located next to the Jewish neighborhood. And the Jewish neighborhoods in England are called Jury's. So the church that was next to the Jewish neighborhood became known as the the Jewry's church. Okay. That's okay, we'll see. Anyway, so so anyway, so that's uh, that's basically the beginning of of, of the, the Jewish situation under the Norman kings, where they're settling in from France and they are um, Again, the communities have to keep in mind, the numbers are very small in what we think about. The, at this point in time, probably 90% of all Jews throughout the world were Sephardim. And so by Sephardim, I mean Spain. Spain contained the majority of Jews in the world. La overwhelming majority. So the Jews that even France, that we think about France, Germany, Rhineland, they were talking about thousands or tens of thousands of people. We're not talking about even hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about tens of thousands of people. So England, um, so that's a good question. So the answer, I think, to me, it seems the answer is like this. Unfortunately, as we'll see, the, again, we'll talk about this a little later. I think the Messira Snafish of Ashkenazi Jewry was, was, was what kind of, uh, I think, kept us, kept us um, stronger for a longer amount of time, but we'll see, we'll see as we go along. Anyway, so, so, um, um, we're, yeah, so we're talking about thousand, just a few thousand people here and there, communities here and there, but these are communities that are very fast becoming one of the more, most affluent communities in England, 
okay, for various reasons, money lending being one of them, because again, in those days you didn't charge five or three percent interest, you charged a significant amount of interest. And so money lending was one of the reasons why the Jews were rich, but there were other reasons. Other reasons were they were scholars. Um, you know, and again, Spain was was still in the in the golden age, and and Spain was the seat of scholarship in the world, and Jews were scholars of multiple disciplines. Not only, I mean, again, obviously, uh, the the Chachom that lived in England were from the Balei Toisus. As we'll see, they were incredible scholars as well. We have Toisus Chachmi Anglia, um, which is uh, which is again the the Torah scholarship was 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 uh, paramount but at the same time we have also um other scholarship that that's that's um that's respected throughout throughout england so um <clears throat> so by henry time by the time henry the first comes well one word about william rufus is that he was disliked by the christians so he was not a loyal so to speak a loyal uh christian king and so he was. He would actually have. Seems to be. Seems to be that he was very fair to the Jews as well. So when when there's a story that one um, that I saw that one when when a father complained that his son converted to Christianity, uh, the king actually tried to talk him to convert back to you know to get go back to Judaism. You know, you know, listen to your father. And the father actually had tried to pay the king money, so he could convince him. But I mean, the kid didn't listen anyways. But but so I'm just showing that this would this is not this is a very unusual behavior for a Christian king. Um, when it comes so fine, so we have come coming down to Henry the First. He ruled from 1100 to 1135, and here we have a more a more gener, a more detailed charter that uh, that allows Jews to move around the land, that g gives gives Jews royal protection and the right to retain pledged property. Right, meaning that if they give loans and land. They can they can collect on that land, okay, and so and but here is where things start to turn, right? Here is where beginning and if I'm thinking time wise, I'm thinking that this is around the Second Crusade, this is around the Second Crusade, 1144 or 49 was the Second Crusade, so it could be again the, the the atmosphere, the climate from other parts of the of Europe are coming are coming to to spill over to the English shores as well. So at 1154, this is again, there's, there's, there's some contention about who's going to be the next king. So we have this new king coming in called Stephen of Blo of, however again, however you pronounce, Blois, Blois, Blois. and uh, so Stephen of Blois um, comes in, and we have this this incredible case, which was the first of its kind at this time. But but as I said before that. For the short 200 year sojourn, again, the Jews are going to be kicked out of England in 1290. Okay, 12 from, from so the Jews from this, this first sojourn will live will, from 1066, from the Norman conquest, till 1290. We're talking about 200 and some years, right? 200 and some years. And during those 200 and some years, England is going to gift us with these two massive. Things called what I will call one is the blood libel, which I want to focus on, and one is the tragedy of York, of York, which we'll discuss also. So the blood libel is 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 an insane thing. We're talking about that since this first case happened, um, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of similar accusations throughout different parts of the world that plagued the Jewish nation for again all of these years since then. Right, and the last ones being still, you know, in the twentieth century, you know, with the with the Mendel, um, uh, the Bayless, the Bayless case, and um, but anyway, so so this is the first one. The first one goes like this: We have this boy. They call him now the William of Norwich, uh, meaning this happened in the town of Norwich. Again, if you look at the map, you could see where exactly the town of Norwich is. He's actually the first documented. Blood libel? This is the first documented blood libel that I this, that I'm Very aware of. Not, not only I mean, the, again, the, the Wikipedia page says that you know um, there was a case that in the in the in even during the Beis Hamikdash there was a suggestion that the Jews capture a Greek to sacrifice in the Beis Hamikdash or some something like that, and then there was it was it was made by by a guy named Apion, and I think Philo. 
or I think it was Philo. The, the Josephus Road. Or Josephus Road, Josephus, I'm sorry, Josephus Contra, Road against yeah, the Contra, yeah. Contra Alpine. I think that was, so they, they, they have these parallels, but, but in terms of this specific Christian blood libel, this was the first of its kind. Um, so, so, and here's the, the situation really, and in the beginning, they, I mean, they blame the Jews. Here's how it goes. So, the, so basically, you have this 12-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy William, who gets apprenticed to, as a tanner, okay? His parents don't really like it, but, the, but the, they, they get convinced, they get paid to get this kid to be apprenticed as a tanner, and, and he goes missing. And then they find a body of a boy in the woods somewhere who was, seems to be, according to some eyewitness reports, seems to have viable, been violently kill, killed, okay? And they, they first do not know who this boy is. They don't immediately identify him. So they bury him, then they exhume him, then the family comes in and they are able to identify him. And somebody right there blames the Jews, which is, of course, because somebody, somebody says that the last thing they saw, they saw him going either into a house of a Jew or something like that, where they blame the Jews right away. Initially, it was not that they blamed the Jews for a ritual murder. It was just, you know, who else do you blame? You blame the Jews, right? The boy, a Christian boy gets killed. It's got to be the Jews, right? It was only later when, when this, this um, person, Imach Shmoy, Thomas of Monmouth, who was a priest, he came and he decided that he wants to do a thorough investigation into this murder. And he afterwards completed this book, this is over many years' work, called The Life and Miracles of William of Norwich. The Life and Miracles of William of Norwich in seven wa volumes. <laughs> Who's William of Norwich? This the is boy. this boy that got killed. Really? Okay. The boy's name was William. Yes. So, and Thomas of Monmouth, again, so he went around and he started asking everybody questions and whatever, I mean, again, the, 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 there are some recent studies of, I mean, the ridiculousness that went into this guy's investigate, quote unquote, investigation. But basically, upon very, very careful analysis and investigation, he came out that the Jews have a prophecy that the temple cannot be rebuilt until, and the, or into a way to speed up the rebuilding of the base of Migdash is by bringing Christian ch children's blood on the on, as a sacrifice. And so, and this was true, he, he said, this is from the, any sources, he says testimony upon testimony, all of it was, you know, obviously, need, needless to say, fake, but, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Fiction, right, exactly. It's true as novel, not a investigation. Right. And, uh, fake news. Fake news, right. And, so, and so, we'll, so he came up with this. Uh, once, once he came into this, and again, even, even before this, I just want to tell you this, they, they actually got all the way up to Stephen of, of, of Blood, meaning the king. They got him to, they wanted him to investigate the matter, and he kind of like uh, shrugged it off. It kind of shrugged it off. So the, the most recent study, which literally came out, I think, a year ago, two years ago, they just suggest that it was a simple roadside robbery, which were very common during those times. And they, they, you know, there are plenty of roadside robberies that go wrong. It was one of those road, roadside robberies that got, got gone wrong. And again, because Jews, as we said before, Jews wore the 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 button that you could press if you wanted to get on the king's case so it was convenient to blame the Jews and Jews were king's property so therefore it's really the king who is responsible because he lets these Jews get away with murder the other thing that I want to mention that Christians have this had this thing in the medieval, medieval times called trial by ordeal okay Are you familiar anybody familiar with trial by ordeal so trial by ordeal is, is you throw, you tie somebody up, you throw them into the water, and you see if they sink or, you know, or, or float or whatnot. So, so many, so if he's innocent, you know, he'll, 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 he'll right. which would float, because the innocent one would sink, they die anyway. Right, so anyway, so, so many Jews were put, actually, so right, right after the trial, some Jews were put into this, the Jews were, they were found under suspicion or because for whatever reason they were 
affecting some those particular ones, the ones that were described in these uh, by by eyewitnesses. All those Jews were put into this trial by ordeal. Okay. Um, anyways, so as and as a result of this. There were again, so some people came to the grave of this young child. The grave was exhumed the second time around to be buried in the in the in, next to the monastery. And then people would come to the grave and they would pray for whatever they would pray. And then the, the they would they would attribute all sorts of miracles and it became a cult. And all of this, so mainly due to this this guy over here, Thomas of Manmer. And now that it was written, written word, of course, has, carries a lot of power. So now that it was written down, it, be, it was widely read, and it became uh, the, 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 the blueprint for all the other accusations that will happen uh, throughout, throughout our history. Um, this is, this is going to be another famous one later, as you will see, turn, if you look at the other one, where is it? The hue of hue of Lincoln was the other major one. Why am I missing it? Little Saint Hugh. Uh, there it is. Yes, in 1255, they correct. I also call him Little Saint Hugh because he was made made into a saint there was a, after there was this. A, a saint Hugh of Lincoln who was a bishop. Right. So they distinguished. They called him Little, right? Yes, that bishop uh, actually was friendly to Jews. Okay, so that's so. This is um, so. This is so. This is the first time, as I said before. This is when we see this huge change. I shouldn't say it's the first time. We find that the Jews were accused for various things before. For example, again, there were constant warfare. Not to go into a whole English history, though, constant warfare. If you look again, look at the map. As you know, when we talk of England, we don't mean the entire. Unite what we call now United Kingdom, right? We know that there was, you know, Wales and Scotland and Ireland, and they were constantly uh, fighting with each other. So oftentimes, so a Jew, Jew, somebody, you know, if a Jew went to Ireland, somebody will accuse them. Oh, he didn't just go to Ireland; he went to Ireland to, you know, to rile up the troops against the king or whatnot, or to to lend the money to, for the war against the king. So there were such accusations, you know, that were always around. Um, when it comes to, it's fine, so we have Henry II becoming king in 1154, and Henry II you should be familiar with, right? He's a famous uh, subject of many different mm -hmm. stories and novels and Shakespeare and who knows what, um, right? See, see, he was the one that was married to, what's her name? Yeah. Something of Aquitaine, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Aquitaine. Right. You're the one who said, uh, will no one read, read me of this troublesome priest with Beckett? Right, Beckett, that was done. Anyway, so, um, so, Hen so under Henry II, we really see Jews kind of reach the peak of terms, in terms of their wealth, and from then on, it's kind of, it's downhill. Um, we have this, this uh, first of, so first of all, in 1158, we have Eb Ebenezer. Ebenezer, as you know, uh, traveled a lot, or if you know, traveled a lot throughout the world. He didn't, you know, he, he was not a stationary person. So in 1158, there was a record of him coming to England, giving a, some 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 shiurim there, some lectures, um, and so that was 1158. Um, and then we have this gentleman by the name of Aaron of, Aaron of Lincoln. Okay, so lived from around 1125 to 1186. Uh, so Aaron of Lincoln, oh, it's getting late. Uh, Aaron of Lincoln was poss possibly the wealthiest person in England at this time, probably or possibly even wealthier than the king. Okay, so Aaron of Lincoln made his money as he was like the bank of England, so to speak, at the time. Even though there were no official banks, but there were just these individuals. But he had a whole. Um, a whole kind of network of agents of his representatives that would also lend money on his behalf. So as we'll see, to the two ma ma main ones that we're going to mention are l lower down, there's the Benedict of York and the Yossi of York. These two people who lived in York, Benedict Pali Baruch and Yossi of York, um, were also very, very wealthy individuals. I mean, the, the, the eyewitness descriptions of their houses were like palaces and 
and uh, you know so these were wealth wealthy people um so uh, but Aaron of Lincoln was the wealthiest of them all and so and but the money what was the you know again in those days the money lending was not you know you and I we didn't there's no credit cards a regular person did not go and borrow money even if a regular person would want to build a house he really did not borrow money mortgages is a very recent invention um so the only people that borrowed money were the big projects either the king to go to war or the you know the priests to build the church or the the earls and the dukes to build the castle that was the only the only kind of lending that was really out there it was for big big projects so so um <clears throat> So numerous churches and castles were built with this money. I mean, numerous. I mean, numerous. And uh, as well as the great synagogue of Lo London at that time, it was before the, the land, or the land belonged to an Aaron, Aaron of, of Lincoln. Again, the records are not so clear, so, so whatever. But, um, so, uh, the, the, the other thing is that when Henry I, I think, well, when Henry I went to war, so he wanted to tax all of the people in order to get money for the war, okay? And in order to tax them, he wanted to do it. So it was a net worth tax. I mean, he wanted to estimate how much everybody's worth, sort of, how much money they had, okay? So, so the entire, the entire, entire, the entire value assessment of, of. The whole population was assessed at about seventy thousand, whatever, the, whatever the, the marks are, whatever they were called. Pounds. What pounds? pounds marks, marks. Marks. I think marks. those days it was marks. Yeah. Seventy thousand marks. Okay, and uh, so, so the Jews' assessment was thirty thousand marks. That means the net worth of Jews, the small, the small population of Jews in England. Was was more, all right, almost almost a half or maybe a, maybe a bit less, but whatever, somewhere around there of the entire population. So we're talking about a very very affluent community, which obviously raises a lot of jealousy and uh, and causes problems. Even today, you know, people don't like rich people too much. So and if they're Jews to boot, and then it's a problem. Um, so. So anyway, so so but so when Aaron of Lincoln actually died in 1186, this is uh, a few years before the ascent of Richard I. So all of his loans became automatically property of the king, and it was I think it was 50, 15,000 marks were outstanding at the time of of his loans. Again, think about it: the entire population net worth was. 70,000, so Iron of Lincoln's loans amounted to about 15,000 marks, okay, 15,000 marks, and uh, all of those loans immediately became property of the king, and there were so many different loans that they actually set up a special exchequer, exchequer is the, is the equivalent of English treasury, to collect the loans and to, to figure out who owes, you know, who owes who, who owes what, so they get they got this special exchequer to collect the money, and it seems that all the way up to 1201, only half of the loans were collected thus far. Once, of course, once the, the loans became property of the king, the king was not allowed to collect interest, so the interest automatically was forgiven. Because, because that's, that was the, the, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly, I'm not sure exactly, but... It's Initially, all the all of the Jews and all of their loans were kind of like under royal protection of the king. So, I'm not sure why it didn't go to inheritance. I think only the only the 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 physical property of of the Jew would go to his heirs. to his Estate. heirs. Estate. But the 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 le the loans would he was not was not able to yarsh in them. And. Um, but and the cash was also dispossessed. All the cash that was available was also dispossessed by the king and was sent over to France to fight the war that he was fighting against against the king there. And but the ship with all the money sunk, so the money did not make it make it to France. Um, but uh, okay, so anyway, so the loans were 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 run by this special exchequer called it was called the Ar the Irons Exchequer. Like a separate, like a department of the treasury, and um, and 
Yeah, okay, so that's it. All right, so now comes this Richard, Richard the Lionheart, you know, mm -hmm. who has, who, who I guess holds such a noble, noble name and noble position in the world, in the world, non-Jewish world, in our world, he's really the, the, the most, one of the most despicable sources for our, for, 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 for our suffering. So the first thing that started from the very beginning, he said at his coronation, Jews should not be allowed in by the coronation at all. During the palace, in the, in the palace area, Jews should not be, would not be allowed in. Okay. Now this couple, these two Jews who were these uh, these right hand mans of 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 Aaron of Lincoln, the, this Benedict of York and Yossi of York, and these were righteous righteous Jews. I presume they, they traveled they traveled to London for the coronation, in order to with with their entourage and their people they probably wanted to have a chance to you know to mend things to to figure out a way to they wanted to show their support for the king as well even though the king said that they were not allowed to enter the the palace area during the coronation but they stood outside where they were you know to greet him to show that to show their their support the the other thing is that that again we just to understand that the society in those days was was very different from the society that we are used to you know i mean especially for yidden for jews they lived constantly as a lower class citizen this is the life that you are used to it's like i mean the only thing that i could think of is you have these un untouchables in india you know they are they living a certain lifestyle, and this is they think that this is the lifestyle they deserve, and this is how it's supposed to be in their society. And so, in the Christian society, Jews were the you know lowest class citizens, even though they were wealthy, but they were still looked upon as the low you know, low low class citizens, and they really did not have any rights. They really you know we think of rights, and we think of the human rights, and we think of certain things that every person deserves dignity. This in those days, this was not so so you know clear. You had rights only if you you know if you were noble, if you're aristocratic, if you were if you were powerful, if you were a Jew. You know, that means that means by definition you had no rights. You had no rights, and so and so they lived constantly. This was their life. They lived constantly, and this was in every land pretty much that they would turn. They lived in really not knowing what the day will bring. But that that was. If you ask them, they did not. I don't think they would be. That would seem ab abnormal to them because I think that's that was their reality. You know, for us, it's very difficult to comprehend. We live very comfortably over here in our land, and we think we have rights. You know, we can complain if something is wrong. We can complain. And we can stand up for our rights, and that was not the case uh, for Jews in the medieval times. And so, first of all, we have to, you know, we have to appreciate the goals that we have. You know, it could have, could have, could have, could, could be much worse. Baruch Hashem, I mean, it was, it was much worse only 75 years ago. So, Baruch Hashem, we have to appreciate all the things that we have. Um, you know, we, we complain a little discomforts here, a little discomforts there, but in, in reality, uh, we are very fortunate. Um, one other thing is that. Um, is that so we have these Jews so coronation is, is, is again if you think about it, obviously coronation is a wild event everybody's full of excitement right but it's also filled with anti-Jewish fervor anti-Jewish feeling and you have this group of Jews coming in to greet the king so what's it's what seems to have happened that is that people as the as the procession was was approaching the king's procession was approaching some people, some of the non-Jews, took the Jews and they pushed them over kind of the gate into the palace area. And then somebody else screamed, oh, Jews are violating the king's orders. And then it went out of control. And all of the people, all of this, this, uh, the, the delegation that was there to receive the king, they got beaten up, they got tortured. This particular person, Benedict, who was again a very wealthy individual, was was tortured so much, was beaten so much. They 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 um, they forced him to convert. 
and he was the, the, what we know he was he actually accepted conversion he could not take it anymore the, the the kind of tortures that he went through he could not he could not say no and so he accepted the conversion okay later he asked the king um, the king he asked the king to resent the, the conversion and uh, one second hold on a second I'll show you the exact the, or the Archbishop yeah he asked I'm sorry he asked the Archbishop of Canterbury Canterbury if he can if he can res, you know rescind the conversion which we according to Christian law you're not really once you are if you went through baptism that's it that's that's for life and so you cannot and you automatically become if you went through baptism once you automatically become under the jurisdiction of the Christian court Christian tribunal and so if, if you know if you're um, how their laws then you could be punishable by death or whatnot if you, so if you rescind Christianity you really should be punishable by death according to their law but the Archbishop for some reason says if you don't want to become Christian okay so you can go become uh, you know part of a uh, servant of the devil which is what he understood the Jewish the Jewish faith to be but it didn't help he would be tortured him so badly that he died on he died from his wounds and and that was the end so this was coronation we're talking about in 1189 in the in the in the fall of 89 okay and from from the coronation once the people heard that rumors started spreading that the Jews were were you know were against the king because because there were rumors that they were they, that the delegation came to do some something negative against the king because they didn't listen, because they went in, the, the king says you cannot come in, they came in anyways. So rumors started spreading and so violent pogroms started spreading throughout the country, all over England, wherever there were Jews, number one. Number two, Richard right away was planning to, this was the time of the third crusade, crusade and Richard was now going to partake in the third crusade, okay? So, so Richard was, so again, the, the spirit was was against the Muslims. Crusades were particular, you know, was against the Muslims, but always the Jews were, were suffering first. So as he was ready, getting ready for the Third Crusade, and as the, as the spirit against the Jews was was spreading throughout the country, here we come to one of these these culmination tragedies, which happened in the in the in the town of York. Okay, the town of York is all the way north, right? So we see that, that Jews have begun spreading. More and more north, um, in, in, in throughout England, and um, so if you go today to 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 York, there is this tower that stands there, this Clifford's Tower. It's called. This is not the original tower that was there. It's pictured here. It's this is the tower that was built later. the The original tower was was made of wood. This is one was made of stone, and. Um, so the community of York was probably, again, it was a small community, but it was a very wealthy community. Both these, Yossi of York and, and, uh, and the Benedict of York, they were very wealthy individuals, with, again, houses that were described as palaces. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the person who organized the pogrom at York to begin was a guy, by the Baron, by the game, name, of, name of Richard Malbis. Okay, so this, 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 this Baron was had many loans to Aaron of Lincoln and now Yossi of York as being his right hand man so he had he had outstanding loans which he was not able to pay and so under the pretense of you know let's get rid of these killers of Christ as we prepare for the crusade he this is how the the mob started to to attack the Jews but even before, but they did the first attack happened at the house of this Jew Benedict of York, where they basically they they the mob ran into his house. They killed his widow and his children. Benedict died from the woods, as I told you before, and they killed his widow, his children, and they burnt they burnt down the house. And uh, and then they started from there. They spread to other Jews. In, in, in the in this area and the Jews so the Jews ran off and they were able to find refuge in the tower okay in the tower of York and which was obviously was built the tower was originally built by William the Conqueror himself meaning it was it was supposed to be a fortress it was supposed to be strong it was supposed to protect 
from these sort of things. So they were kind of more or less safe over there. The, the person who let them in was the keeper of the tower, whatever, I don't know his name. And, uh, but, but at some point they noticed that the keeper of the tower was scheming with the crowd outside. So when the keeper of the tower left, so they, they locked the tower and when he came back, they did not let him back in because they knew that it's something he was up to no good. So at this point, they had no allies, so to speak, left whatsoever. The mob outside was going crazy. They were, you know, throwing rocks back and forth. The Jews were tr throwing rocks from the tower. The, 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 uh, the other guys were throwing whatever they can, but they could not yet go into the tower. But it was just a matter of time. Reinforcements were coming. The army was coming. It was just a matter of time till they were... They were going to break through this tower. This happened on Erev Shabbos Hagodo in the, in the year um, 1190. Okay, Erev Shabbos Hagodo in the year 1190. Just before this, I mean, the, the, the rabbi of the community, the rabbi of the community was one of the great Balei Atoysos by the name of Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbeinu Yom Tov Ben Yitzchak of, they call him Miyuni, Rabbeinu Yom Tov Miyuni, okay, Uni, again, I, I don't know if that's how you get it. It's spelled, as you can see from there, J-O-I-J-N-Y, however you pronounce that in French. Uh, but so he, he is originally from France. Uni, Uni is a town that um, that's about maybe an hour away from Tro from Troyes, which is Rashi's, Rashi's mm -hmm. city. So about an hour away from Troyes. Um, so not far from Sanz, which was another famous Jewish town. Uh, nothing, not, not, not the Sanz yeah. from Europe, but the Sens from France. Anyway, so Rebbeinu Yom Yom Tov of, of Uni appears in our Toysos five times. In the Toysos that we have on the page, he appears five times as Rebbeinu Yom Tov Miyuni. There are other Yom Tov that we're not sure, but we know for sure that at least five times we have Rebbeinu Yom Tov Miyuni um, as, as mentioned in one of the Balea Toysos. You probably also, if you remember any from your uh, Tfilos of Yom Kippur, there's one of the most, I mean, to me, one of the famous um, Piyutim of Yom Kippur is called Amnam Cain. Uh, Amnam Cain has a nice tune to it, which I'm not going to sing for you now. But anyway, so, so he's the author of Amnam Cain. At least it's, it's attributed to him. So Rabbi Yom Tov Miyuni was one of the G'doyle G'doyle of Baal And so he's, he is, him and his community are now locked in this tower, are now locked in this tower with the raging mob outside, and they know that, that the, the mob is going to either torture them or kill them or both, or f through torture force them to commit, to, to convert to Christianity just like they did with, ben with Benedict earlier. So they come to this decision where about 150 people, and we have, um, we have this from the, 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 the chronicles of Rabbeinu Ephraim Mibona, Mibon, um, where the, the entire community basically commits suicide. It's one of the strangers, the most peculiar episodes in Jewish history where the, about 150 people that we, we, we think, 150 people, their children, their wives, they all, they, they, they make a bracha ala shechita, and they, you know, and they re go one by one, and they kill their children, the men kill their wives, then they kill themselves, and uh, some, so, so it seems that Rabbeinu Yom Tov was the last to be killed, to kill himself. He, he killed, he, Rabbeinu Yom Tov himself, killed this Yossi, of York, it seems like he was the one that, meaning I guess they, 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 get, they have some kind of an honor code, an honor system, and he killed himself last, and um, there were few survivors, there were few, they, they, they were, nobody was forced to do this. It seems like Rabbeinu Yom Tov got up again from the chronicles of Ephraim of Buna, Rabbeinu Yom Tov got up and he says, uh, you know, uh, our forefathers, you know, died for, for our religion, he, you know, these, this, this was not the first time such a thing happened. As we discussed during the Kinois, during the First Crusade, there were already such episodes where fathers would rather kill their kids, murder their kids, uh, than have them be tortured and taken to, into, into, into Christianity. 
Okay, so to to this was so to answer the question of how is it possible, how is it that the Ashkenazi Jews and you know Sephardic Jews, it was very different. When it comes came to conversion, Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews took a very very different paths, right? It's mo most of the Sephardic Jew Jewry converted to Christianity, and most of the Ashkenazi Jews would rather die than convert. In numerous cases, in numerous stories. And, and at the same time, it seems, as ironic as it, as it, as it may be, it becomes, it becomes the ticket for survival for everybody else. Because nobody, you know, I, I mean, if, 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 if there's no point in trying to convert somebody if you know that they're not going to convert. If they're willing, we're gonna, they're going to die instead of convert. So, just like, so... I won't, I'll end off soon, but I want to read to you a tshuva from Aram Rattenberg on this issue. Is this, is this permissible? I mean, this raises a lot of questions. It's a pain of painful, very painful subject because, because again, we can't even fathom a reality where a family commits suicide, murder together in order to stay, be faithful to their faith. We cannot fathom even under what circumstances can such a thing occur. Because, like I said, we live a very different lifestyle. We live in a different society. You know, I mean, we, can we fully appreciate it? I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can, number one. I don't know if we have to, number two. But it is a reality. Um, and I guess, I guess I'll, I'll read this chuva from the Maharam, right? Again, this question is discussed at length. I'm not sure if it's it's rarely di I, I I don't know it's rarely directly discussed the permissibility of the halachic permissibility of murder. We know that Avodah Zarah is Yehorik Val Yaba, and if you believe Christianity is Avodah Zarah, we understand at least conceptually we understand that there is an idea of Yehorik Val Yaba that the person can die for their faith. We understand to some degree that, that idea conceptually we understand it. Why do we understand it? Because if a person has nothing to live for, to die for, then the person has nothing to live for. If a person is not willing to, to, to sacrifice himself for anything, that means he's only living for himself, which is quite an empty, empty existence. On the other hand, on the other hand, we understand, generally speaking, when we're talking about making that ultimate sacrifice, we understand it more with passive ter terms. We understand that if somebody comes to you with a gun and says, I'll kill you if you don't accept my religion, you just shrug it off and let him do whatever he does. Uh, we understand that. The, over here, we do not understand, we have a much harder time understanding how a, a family, can, how parents can... I mean, if, again, if I think about my children, as much as I, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, every day I, I say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and I say that, you know, and I'm willing to be Moisir Nefesh for, for my faith, right? But can I, can I possibly foresee killing my own child for my own wife? I cannot. I cannot, right? So, but, <clears throat> but, um, but again, like I said, but this, this is, to so this episode, illustrates though that again one thing is illustrated is the society was very different in those days society was very different another thing that it illustrates is that is that Jews throughout the ages we have sacrificed a lot for for the Reboi Neshulayla you know as we say as we we saw in the in the in the Kina of uh, of Rabbi Nuklonimus you know Hatoi V'meitiv we called out to Hashem who's good and who does good you know that he should uh, he should uh, turn to us and protect us and, and save us, you know, and accept our sacrifice. And it really is Baruch Hashem that we don't have to make these sacrifices because these kedoshim, you know, these holy people, has have made that sacrifices for us. So again, with, I'm not going to discuss again. There's mu much to discuss halachically speaking, but Tishbab is not the time for halachic discussions. But right, whether or not it fits with our halachic framework or not. But I will read to you from this chuva from Maram Rattenberg. Maram Rattenberg himself, as you know, spent 23, I believe, years of his life in prison. Because, because uh, he did not allow his community to, rent, to, to pay the ransom for him. Right? So because, again, for the very reason that he did not want others to, you know, to, 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 there should be copycat crimes, that people should not 
If it becomes profitable, out. right, there becomes a business out of it, right? So anyway, so over here he is asked, Yehudi echot shoal as maram sheichia im tzorich kaporo al shoshachat ishtoi v'dalat bonov b'yoyim horeg rav b'kublins. So the, I'm not sure what happened in kublins, but again, it was one of those similar situations where where people where people were I guess committing suicide and killing their families in order to maintain be faithful, and so. But this particular individual, the, 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 it says, Ki kach bikshu, the, the, the wife and the children, they asked, they wanted to be killed. Because there, were, there is a story which is going to bring, the, the Gemara and Gittin brings a story of uh, uh, 400 shenish bulu kolon. Uh, 400 yilodim v'yilodosh shenish bulu kolon. Kolon is... Pearl. What? Pearl. Yeah, in Germany. No, this is from Gemara. Kolon just means like uh, from a klol, like a disgusting thing. So, they, they so they were probably the they were gonna do. They're gonna be abused. Right, they were gonna do. Version. Right, they were gonna be used for inappropriate things. And as they were being transported across the water, they asked whether they're allowed to, you know, drown, and so as not to be forever, you know, sub subjugated to this to this kind of lifestyle. And so, and then, and and whoever asking for them over there, they said yes. Hashem, uh, I don't have the lotion now, but this this is an acceptable way out, and so they all jumped overboard and committed suicide. So this is a story, in in over there, and so, and so, um, so so I'm saying so this this the, the precedent, if you want to call it, that exists in the Gemara. So anyway, so kach bikshu, so the, his children and his wife, they asked him, they asked him to be killed, so they would not be open for the, who knows, again, the mob, when the mob is, is riled up, we don't know what could happen, and what terrible things they could do. And so, So all the, the mob was, was, was pillaging and murdering. He also wanted, he was supposed to kill himself after killing his wife and children. Somehow, through intervention of some going, before he was able to kill himself, he was now saved, this individual. So imagine, you know, he killed his own wife and children, now he's left alone, and, and he wants to know, should, is there any kapora that he has to undergo? Meaning, kapora meaning, you know, the tshuva, whether financial restitution, something that he has to do in order to atone for the murder of his wife and children. So this is a very difficult truth. And that, so the Maharam himself is so he writes because of loy loya dana shapir my ibn bay. I don't know well what how to judge this. Right? So even the Maharam is is not comfortable with this with this. Kivada Horigatsma Yikuda Shem Rishai La Hakoy Le Lachboy Lasa Baatsma. So clearly he says suicide, that precedent we already have. Okay, and he brings from 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 the from Shoal, He brings from a few cases from this case of 400 Yelodim. That I, again, I'm not going to read the whole the whole thing. So we have we have cases where suicide is 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 an acceptable way out. And again, I I don't want to get into detail, but it, I think it's totally in Toys' understanding of. Of of the sugya and and and, uh, and uh, Sanhedrin of of um, not in Sanhedrin only really Mivamas but anyways it's totally Toysus understanding of of when a person is obligated to give up his life and especially in the case where where you know you know that 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 you will not be able to withstand the circumstances later do you have a chiv to give up now. So Toysus holds that that one does, and that's I think that's really where the, the source comes from. So so if you if you're in a situation where the the avera for which you are supposed to be horik val yaver is going to come later, and you're going to you know that you're going to be forced in such a way that there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it, so then maybe even now you would be allowed to to um, to take action in order to give up one's life. Okay, so. So I'm skipping these next few lines. It goes, Mihud over Zeh, Poshat Hatera. Unfortunately for this thing, 
the 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 permissibility of this kind of action has already already came, came to be because we we heard and we find that many great people that they will shecht their sons and daughters right and I said before I mean they would actually pronounce the bracha of Allah shechita and it could be later they they amended the bracha with saying Allah shechita al kiddush Hashem something like that. The Gam Rabbeinu Klonimus, this is the, from the Kina that we read, also came. He did this. Okay, so, so, so therefore I want to bring a raya for, to, to permit this, because, and again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically he was saying just like, Suicide, there is really no difference. His logic is as follows. There is really no difference between suicide and homicide. Suicide is just homicide of, of yourself. So if suicide is permitted, then homicide is also permitted. That's basically the, the, the cheshman. But he says, If any, of, any rabbi requires kapora for this individual, who moitzilaz al chasidim arishoyim. It's like he's putting a bad name to the original chasidim. Okay, from the, the, this abundance of love towards our Creator, okay, Pogav and Noga Bamaimad Evnov, so etc. Then they asked for it, so he did he did what he could do best under the circumstances, and so he does not require kapar. Okay, so this is the truth of the Mara Miracle book, and it's you see from it the the variables that are taking place that if you know from the multiple the, the different stodim that exist and how difficult how difficult this situation is and so even though it started come kind of this the whole idea started around the, the first crusade i think york um you know is 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 the is the culmination it's the only one of its kind on such a big level where so many people did this on on such a massive scale and so did they now again, like I said, it was optional. Nobody was forced to do this. The majority of the people did do it. There were some people who opted not to commit suicide, and um, and but the, and, and the Christians on on the, on the outside, the, the goyim on the outside, convinced them to open the door and to come out, and they were instantly tortured and killed. So nobody, in the end of the day, nobody escaped alive from this from this tragedy. Okay, they call it the York's darkest hour. And if you go to Clifford's Castle, there is now a plaque there that that you know kind of like says, "Oops, you know, we're sorry." But uh, and if you look at the picture, the other thing that they did here is what, the, what we got for it is daffodils. Um, they planted daffodils around the Clifford's Tower. In order to commemorate the or in memory of the fallen Jews around the, the tower, why daffodils? Because they're flowers. Uh, what? They, they were gonna get, they were going to be safe. That they're not gonna do anything to them. If you just let them in, they're they're gonna guarantee their safety, and then it didn't happen. And so the daffodils, these daffodils, they have, they have six petals. So the six petals are supposed to represent the, the Mother David. So. Okay. Okay. Well, with, with Sada, there was also a. Right, right. Sorry, Something like that happens in, uh, in Germany. In Germany, I think mines. Some, also right. Happened something like that, right? Well, from during the First Crusade. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, so, then, so the king was not too pleased. <laughs> Officially, with this, with the with these these events again, because Jews were property of the king, the king would not be too happy. Oh, also, right after right after the the, the destruction of the Jews, they went all the, they went to the the whatever the the the, um, the record keeping office and they burnt all of the records of Jewish loans, um, in of the town of York again because the the real the real motivation for this was the they wanted to get rid of the the debts that they had. And um, by the way, the, what's interesting, just again, this is a side theory, but in, in, in the, the loans, the loans, the earliest, the earliest financial bond in England actually comes from Yossi of 
York, this Yossi that was killed in this, during this, this tragedy. And, um, and they, they used to be called star, right? We call contracts star. So in England, they called stars, star, S-T-A-R-R, -S star. Okay, and some, some theorize that the star chamber, which is what the English call their Supreme Court, is actually originates from the, from the Hebrew word star, which is where the, the office where the mm -hmm. star is were kept because there were, there were three copies made of every contract. One was for the lender, one was for the borrower, and one was kept at this some place called the star, you know, possibly called the star chamber. And so, anyway, so the, right after the, the tragedy of York, all of the records were destroyed. Nobody. So some people in the, 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 the punishment, any punishment, did the king, did the king have any punishment? The answer is, yeah, there, were some, there were some questioning going on. Some of the people in the, in the, the, the council of the, of the city were demoted. Nobody went to jail. There were some fines. Half of, most of them were not paid because, again, the king was, was too busy with the Third Crusade. And I think even Malbis himself joined the king on, on the crusade. And so in the end of the day, after the tragedy, nobody gets, nobody gets, gets punished for it. Okay. But um, anyways, uh, much later than we anticipated, there is another kina, I guess I'll end off here, there is another kina that we did not read. Maybe we'll, we'll read now. I don't know if we should read now. Maybe we'll read it now together. We left it for, it only appears in this. It does not appear in the art scroll um, kinas. This is the kina that was composed by Rabbeinu Yosef of Sh Chartres, or Cartres. Okay. All right. So, um, so it was so the date of it here it says 1170 that's that's incorrect it probably means 1270 or it probably means 1270 i'm not sure um so the 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 kina because so this kina kind of weaves into a little bit some of the names some of the people that were involved in in the tragedy and it talks about it talks about the 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 tragedy and it curses the the land of england in many ways, um, and references the, the Gemara and Gittin as well. Again, in, in hints. He mentions, right, if you look at the notes, again, I don't know, it's, too, it's too long already not to discuss it, but if you look at the notes on this particular, in this particular kinois, they, they reference some of the things that I've mentioned. And they explain the, some of the names. Okay, so maybe we'll we'll, we'll say the kina together now, and then we will. Uh, we'll